Our second part is dedicated to investigation. Uh, the low collision investigation is the cornerstone to justice. Any chance of detecting and prosecuting criminal culpability or determining civil liability fairly depends on it. Collision investigation has the potential to ensure accurate understanding of crash causation and contributory factors and does contribute greatly to road traffic injury prevention. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Mikael Vede. Uh, Dr. Vede is an expert, um, expert for road traffic uh, accidents and uh, analysis of accident data in Berlin. Over the past 20 years, he supervised a large number of study and diploma theses. In particular, uh, he developed the so-called biofidelic dummy uh, together with uh, his students. Uh, he's a lecturer at the HTW Dresden, where he holds the lecture computational accident reconstruction in the field of vehicle technology. Dr. Vede will present uh, the need for sufficient event data prior, during, and after an impact from the view of accident research and analysis. Dr. Vede, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Benita, for the uh, introduction. Well, I want to give you some information on um, what uh, the state of art is at present for EDR, this event data uh, recorders, um, because from our perspective, for accident reconstruction, there is a need um, to have more information than it is present in the EDR. And it was quite interesting what um, Mr. Schroeder said and also what Yolanda said from Catalonia. Um, of course, we see that victims are always there in heavy accidents because it's not um, only the person who has done any fault because it was driving too fast, too fast. There's always a victim on the other hand. And for legal um, uh, security, it's a need that we have proper data and proper data to reconstruct what really happened prior to the accident because the problem is due to the lack of um, traces on accident scenes prior to the impact, we cannot really tell how fast the cars or the motorcycles have driven before they, um, the, they had been braked. So we only can reconstruct how fast they had been at this very short moment of impact. And we have another problem. Um, you know from the statistics that most um, victims nowadays, especially the fatalities, they are not anymore the people inside the cars, they are vulnerable road users, such as um, cyclists and motorcyclists, and of course, pedestrians. And for um, actually see what happened in such an accident where a vulnerable road user was um, a, a victim, we don't have any data at all. Why? Because the regulations, the US regulation, uh, maybe come to the next, um, um, uh, slide. Yolanta, can you um, put the next slide? Yeah, because the US regulation um, in the so-called um, Code Federal Rule 49 Part 563, um, there is no data nowadays um, when they have a road, um, a vulnerable road user. Why? Because the um, uh, US regulation says you only have data either if there has been a restraint system deployed, such as an airbag or a belt pretensioner, and or if the delta V, which is a change of um, velocity during the impact, is higher than 8 kph in a time increment of 150 milliseconds. And this is what usually does not happen. And we have done a lot of crash tests um, using a biophedalic dummy, and there we see even if you have a high speed impact at a speed of 100 kph, you might not have any information in the car on this accident because the car just didn't recognize this accident due um, to the US regulations. And at the moment, um, there is a working group, an informal working group, which is working on new regulations. And I just want to show you how it could be better and um, actually to improve road safety and also to improve the abilities for victims to show in the jurisprudence what actually happened. So maybe next slide, please. Um, these are, is a table on 
the minimum data elements for the US norm. And the US regulations say um, that the cars have to save data uh, and the following parameters, but they don't have to save it in general. They just have to save it. If they save any kind of data, you have to save this minimum parameter. The minimum parameter is the delta V, which means the change of speed over a time interval of 150 milliseconds. Then the maximum change of speed within a, uh, a time increment of 300 milliseconds and the time which was needed to reach this maximum speed change. Um, and now we come to really important things which we never would know without this data in these event data recorders. And just to give you some General information, the, general, the um, event data recorder is part of the airbag control module, okay? And all the cars, every car stores some data in the airbag control module. Why? Because the airbag control module has to measure acceleration all the time in order to know, well, this was not normal driving, this was an impact. And I just show you in a minute, I show you a couple of examples. But what is important, important for the reconstruction, I told you, is not what actually happened during the impact, it is what happened five seconds before. And this is the US regulation, what it says. The US regulation says we measure on uh, save the information of the so-called vehicle indicated speed. And this is over a period of a five seconds with a uh, sample rate of two hertz. So this means every 0.5 second, um, we get the information on the speed, which was indicated to the driver. So what the driver saw on the dashboard, this is this. Then you can see whether the driver was accelerating. We have the position of the throttle or the uh, accelerator paddle. And um, you also can see whether the brake was used or not, but it's just a yes or no. And you can see whether the driver or the passenger was belted or not. And you also have a warning lamp, whether the airbag function was given or not. And if the airbag had a mistake, then the airbag um, warning lamp is on. And you have uh, information on the whole time of an airbag uh, deployment, especially the time interval between um, if the airbag has one more than one sta uh, stage, so one first and second stage airbags. Next slide, please. Um, so what is Delta V and why is Delta V not usable for um, vulnerable road users? The Delta V means the change of speed during an impact and this value, it's not really measured. This value is a calculated value. And the calcu calculated value is calculated over a time period of 150 milliseconds. So this seems to you very short, but um, in a crash with a pedestrian, it's a rather long time. Or otherwise, in a car, car crash, it's a long time. A pedestrian crash consists actually of more than just one crash. There's a crash on the legs, and then crash on the hips, crash on the thorax, crash on the head. So this might take a longer time. But the whole change of speed over a period of 150 milliseconds, which leads to trigger a recording of data, and as I told you, the data is measured all the time, but it's not recorded or it's not saved, um, only occurs if a speed change of um, 0 0.8 kph, 8 kph was uh, starting um, over a whole period of 150 milliseconds. But how does the airbag unit actually knows that this was not normal driving? And this is a very interesting way how they determine the beginning of an impact. And I say, okay, if you have a delta V of 0 0.8 kph within a period of 0 0.02 seconds, so this is 20 milliseconds in longitudinal direction, and this is something which is not normal, so this is the beginning of something strange. And if now the acceleration is staying on this low level or the deceleration, then please next slide, then the um, recording will start. And how does it work? Um, it is actually, it's an integration. It's an integration over the acceleration over time. And for each time period, it's always 20 milliseconds. So how does it work? It works that in all cars, you have a so-called acceleration sensor, which is a microelectronic mechanical system. If you 
just go to the next slide. It gives you a short interpretation of what it looks like. On the right side, you see um, the computer, which is part. And on the left side, you see the actual sensor. The actual sensor works a little bit. You can see my um, papers, my pen here. And if the car is moving, the, um, you, you see this um, structure like uh, a camp. And this is moving. And you can imagine it. If my car is braking, one part is moving and the other one is stable. So by the change of the moving of the car, and you can see how faster the car is getting slower, the more it is moving. And therefore, we can measure the change of speed over time by acceleration sensor. Please, next slide. And this is um, a crash test where you can see how it looks like and how the um, interpretation or the uh, integration of the uh, start, please start the video on the left side, um, how the integration works. So this is a rear end crash and you see, does it work? Yes. This is the real beginning of the crash of the whole time. It's a collision speed was 15 kph and on the right side, you see the longitudinal acceleration. Next slide. This is a crash again. It seems to work. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the beginning. This is actually the real time zero, okay? But not the time zero when the crash is detected because at that point, no one knows that this is the beginning because it's just touching of two bumpers. And if you now start the video, left side, Okay, now you see about 20 milliseconds later, you have, you have a small slight change, but the time increment is not enough to start the um, system to know that the impact was. But after 0.033, so 33 milliseconds, the system recognized, okay, this is something happened. So at this point, when the system starts with an algorithm, this is T0, had already crashed for 30 milliseconds. So next slide, please. And then the integration keeps on, keeps on. And it always keeps on for a period of 150 milliseconds. And if after a period of 156 milliseconds, so this is a total crash time now at 1.16 uh, uh, seconds, then the delta V in this case was 14.5 kph. So the delta V, the speed change is above the trigger. So it exceeded eight kph. So what is going to happen in this case, you will have this information, which was given you in the table before. So we know the speed of the car over a period of five seconds before the impact. Please carry on, next slide. It doesn't matter what happened next, okay? Because once you have stored the data, then or you have triggered the storing of the data to be correct, then it'll store the data over a period of 250 milliseconds after the impact and five seconds before the impact. Okay, and it doesn't matter maybe that the sensor is now going into the other direction, doesn't matter, just next slide, because the delta V had exceeded eight kph, so therefore we will have a saving and we will have a saving of the data which was recorded over the period of 250 milliseconds. Okay, next slide, please. So is delta V, so the speed change, really always applicable to identify an impact? Because um, what other options are they? And much better is actually to measure not the calculated change, but the actual sensor. So the acceleration itself or the change of the sensor. I'll show you next slide, please. So. How does it work? If you look at the curve on the right side, you see the magenta um, color curve. This is the um, longitudinal change in uh, the longitudinal acceleration. So acceleration is the change of speed. And you see that the um, curve has a steep change. And this steep change is what we call a jerk. And the jerk is most important to predict that an accident is going to happen because at that point when the airbag has to be deployed 
It must be before the driver in the car moves forward. Please, next slide. So what is a jerk? A jerk is the change of the acceleration. So it is actually from my sensor how quick the sensor is moving. It's not the quickness of the car, it's the quickness of, the, um, of my sensor. And so mathematically, it's the derivation of this, um, of this um, acceleration. So please give the next um, slide. So we have this case here where a car, a rear end collision, and the question was, was this a mistake of the airbag? Because if you look at the next slide, you see it's a rather, well, not much damaged car. And the owner of the car said, well, this must be a mistake because um, why, if you look at the next picture, um, are the airbags deployed and you can hardly see any damage. And in other cases, when a pedestrian, for instance, is hit at a speed of 80 or 100 kph and the whole car is damaged, there's no airbag deployed. And here you have airbag deployment. Please, next slide. Next slide, just the pictures, just to give you an impression. So from the pictures, you wouldn't have actually thought that an airbag would have deployed. And if you see that the impact speed was only about 18 kph and the car was braked before the impact, so um, 18 kph is not that much. But if you look at the next uh, slide, you see how it works. The reason why the airbag was deployed was not because the delta V was so high. The reason is to predict what is going to happen. The delta, the, the acceleration graph has to be analyzed and it has to be analyzed before the, um, the driver or the um, the passenger has moved forward so far that he might come out of position. So by detecting a significant change in the acceleration, which we call a jerk, it is possible to predict what is going to happen in the next milliseconds. And in this case, for instance, due to a rather, rather hard rear end of the one car and a rather hard front end of the other car, we had a high change in the deceleration within a very short period of only five milliseconds, very short period. And this five milliseconds, we predict what is going to happen within the next 20 or 30 milliseconds. And then you see, we can see, well, this will end where my, maybe the acceleration come, will come to a level where the car will be that much decelerated that the driver needs an airbag to protect to be protected. Okay, next slide, please. So we see a crash test here and you can see from, well, that works, yeah. Maybe you can stop the video, uh, Benita. At that point, drive it a little bit backwards so that you can see, and then you can, yeah, go a little bit backwards so that you can see that the airbag deployed before the head of the driver had moved a little tiny bit, okay? So you see just, Okay, stop, stop, stop this. Okay, perfect. You see that the airbag is already deployed and the head of the driver had not moved at all. Okay, and the airbag is already fully inflated. Okay, you can now leave it and run it. Next slide. So what we have from the EDR module, from the EDR module in the airbag control module, we can see that the delta V, the change of speed was, 40, it was 27 kph. 27 kph or 26.8. So this is the change of speed. Next slide. But what we want to know is how fast was actually the Toyota? And just next slide. It should work. Yeah. Here you can see the longitudinal acceleration and lateral acceleration. For us, it's important here is the longitudinal acceleration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is the, the whole time, the whole period of the impact was about if you just click the buttons yeah it will, the whole um, time of the um, impact itself was only about 70 milliseconds so it's a very short period but at the beginning within the first five milliseconds we had a change in the acceleration of 50 meters per square second so this is the moment where the airbag detects well if this is 
going on with this high deceleration, next slide, then we have to have an um, deployment. So you see the data from this EDR and the data from additional measurement instruments, they are absolutely exactly um, compatible. So there's no doubts on the measurements in the EDR. Okay, next slide, please. Um, but how fast was the Toyota at the impact? So the measurements inside the EDR, inside the Abic human unit, they are quite correct. Did you recognize it? What happened to the front re uh, wheel? The front wheel just stopped for a very short moment. If you look again at the video, maybe you didn't see it, but it was interrupted a little bit, but you can come to the next slide and I can show you in the next slide that you can see what happened. So this is the crash sensor in the front of the car detected that there was an impact and the front. This is very beginning. And then you see that wheel slips, wheel slip leads to a gap between the real speed and the indicated speed, which is indicated to the driver. And the real speed is also not the wheel speed because the wheel speed is due to the fact that the wheel stopped for a very short moment, never the real speed. The wheel speed is not the real speed. <laughs> okay. And if you look at the wheel speed, the average wheel speed is 30 kph. So in a trial in court, of court, if you just had the EDR data, you would say, well, collision speed was 30 kph. But 30 kph can't be true because if the change of speed was already 27 kph and the car did not stop at that moment at the impact, it still moved about four meters or five meters further on. So you see, next slide please, that the um, values for the pre-collision speed is not correct in the EDR at present. You can only prove the real speed if you have acceleration data and not only acceleration data over this very short moment of 250 milliseconds, but prior to the impact. So in order to clarify what really happened before the impact, you need not only the wheel speed or the indicated speed, you also need the acceleration. And the acceleration is measured anyway in the ABBA control unit, so it's no problem to have this data in an EDR. And this is very important that a judge can really judge correctly, because you see here, the real speed was not 30 kph, the real speed was 43 kph. Okay, next slide, please. So interim conclusion, without any pre-collision acceleration data, the collision speed cannot be determined correctly. And on the US regulation, neither the braking or the real maneuvering of the car, the steering is um, actually safe. It's just a question whether it is safe, whether you're braking yes or no. So what you need is acceleration data in longitudinal and lateral way in order to reconstruct as well the speed of the car correctly as the position of the car, whether the car, for instance, was moving or um, driving a curve or a bend. And last not least, the delta V of 8 kph within a period of 150 milliseconds is insufficient to have any data. So that will lead if the um, UNEC regulations will just adopt the US regulations, we will not have any EDR data in uh, cases of vulnerable road users. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have a real case. This is, um, of course, anonymized. Um, as uh, Benita told you, I'm um, investigating um, real accidents and I'm working for um, German police, especially Berlin police, and they have um, a, a thing, uh, well, a measurement um, device in their car, which is called UDS. This is uh, German means Unfalldatenspeicher. The English um, translation would be accident data recorder. And it is quite similar to the EDR, the event data recorder, but it's recording with a higher preciseness and especially higher resolution, so a higher sample rate. In this case, you, we had um, the final position of the car about 50, uh, 75 meters after the point of um, impact. And you see at the beginning, there are no traces. You can see any traces at all. So you would never have known that the accident had been even far further away from the, um, if we did not have the data. So next slide, please. 
We retrieved the data from the ABBA control unit via a tool called Bosch CDR tool, and you see there's no data. And if you look at the car, you would rather expect if you compare this damage to the damage of the car, the um, Ford I just showed you where the airbag deployed, you would also think as a layman, you would say, well, this should have data inside, okay? No, not. No data, no um, deployment of any restraint system in this Volkswagen Touran. Next uh, step, please. Next, okay. So why don't we have any Delta, uh, any uh, ABAC deployment, and why don't we have even no data in the, uh, in the um, ABAC control module in the so-called um, event data recorder? Because the speed change, the change of velocity, the delta V over a period of 150 milliseconds was only 6 kph. 6 kph is below 8 kph, therefore there's no data. Okay, next sli uh, slide, please. Um, if you now look at the data, you see that the car was actually braked 25 milliseconds before the impact. You can see the speed was far above 100 kph, okay? So for the victim, it would be quite nice to know what the car really was driving and what speed it was, okay? And you can see that there is something and you don't have to be a professional um, interpreter. You immediately see, if you see the graphs and the, and the curves and the top of this, um, of this graph, that there is a sudden change in lateral and longitudinal and normal acceleration. And this is what is clearly to be defined as the beginning of the impact. And this sudden change of the acceleration is what we call the jerk. So why not take the jerk, the jerk as a starting point for not only detecting this is an impact, but also for starting point to say, okay, now we want to have to save the data because for victims, it's important to have this information, which you see in the graph below, in the graph below that this car was driving at a speed of over 100 kph. And we are talking about, um, an accident which happened um, in a city, in a town. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, perfect. Um, so you can see um, over a period from um, the just um, the um, f five seconds before the impact, and here you just see the acceleration data. It's of course easily to be seen that there is a sudden change in lateral and normal and uh, um, uh, longitudinal acceleration. And you can also see, which is quite typical for accidents with pedestrians, that you have a first impact and you have a second impact when the thorax hits the A pillar, for instance. Okay, next slide, please. So from the change of acceleration, we can calculate the jerk. And we see that a jerk of above 500 meters per square, not per square, per second to the power of three, within four milliseconds, this is, will never happen during normal driving. So therefore we can say something happened there. This is an event which is worth to be saved, worth for protecting the legal certainty for victims. Okay, next slide, please. So interim conclusion. Delta V on its own is not suitable for a differentiation on an impact from normal driving. But we need this in order to know that an accident happened, especially an accident with vulnerable road users. So Delta V is generally below 8 kph in a normal, in a normal car um, after an impact against a cyclist or a pedestrian. So we need a different trigger for crash detection. The acceleration is recorded in a sufficient sampling rate in every car nowadays above 500 hertz. So this data would be able to detect the jerk and the jerk derived from this acceleration is very easily to be calculated. So we can see that a jerk exceeding 500 meters per, square, per second to the power of three within five milliseconds is a reasonable value in order to detect even impacts against road uh, vulnerable road users on the one hand and does not occur during normal driving. I just give you here an example. You see this was a crash test and you see the crash test. Um, just next slide, you've, you've seen that and um, you can see here that this 
not full impact, only part impact, leads, next slide please, um, lead it um, to a sufficient change in the acceleration and the jerk. Next slide please, we can rather go through that quickly. Uh, so we can see here that the beginning of the impact is detected. Next slide please, even in this rather heavy vehicle of two tons, you can see that the jerk is above 500 meters per uh, second to the power of three. Next slide, please. So summary, if there is no acceleration data saved prior to the impact, collision speed is not to be reconstructed sufficiently by the present EDR according to the US regulation. And because wheel speed differs enormously from real speed, the car is braked and accelerated. Neither braking acceleration or steering behavior nor the real trajectory of the car is to be reconstructed properly. Um, and if there is no longitudinal or lateral acceleration and no collisions with vulnerable road users such as pedestrians or cyclists are detected by the present EDR because according to the US regulation, a speed change of more than eight kph with 150 milliseconds is needed to trigger. But in real cases, show we very seldom um, have a speed change exceeding eight kph. So to come to an outlook and end to my presentation, um, next slide, please. So we need a measuring and storing of the uh, acceleration data in order to um, ensure that this information, which is in cars anyway, um, are, uh, is um, there for correct um, jurisprudence to ensure legal certainty and a protection of the victims. Okay, thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to our second panelist uh, in this part. This is Professor Dr. Ander Berthes, who is Director of the Institute of Physics Education for Development and Evaluation of a Training Software that models and visualizes the behavior of car and driver in speeding accident. He was awarded as a safety star in 2004 by Renault Nissan Europe and the German Association of the Driving Instructors. How a human brain models uh, physical, physical reality during car driving situated by functional magnetic resonance imaging, imaging was the focus of interest in a follow-up research. Dr. Bershis, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. And I hope you can all listen to me. Um, I've provided uh, access to this presentation via a link and perhaps uh, Vanita can uh, just uh, share this link to everybody who is listening so that you can see what's coming to you in advance. Um, this is myself. Um, as Juanita said, I have made my postdoc thesis about how human beings are modeling the environment around them. And uh, what is happening in these times is that cars do likewise. And that will be um, the topic of my talk. Um, the amazing capability of modern cars to uh, report the surroundings. Because we had this amazing talk of Michael um, just minutes before, uh, so we know what incredible amount of data the car is storing inside. And I will just uh, refer to this um, picture right here. Um, that's basically what you told. So there are so many data that um, are transferred in the car that can be accessed by an EDR unit. But another thing that um, comes to my mind when you were talking, Michael, is that these cars are essentially blind. Yes, they are um, sensing something that touches the car, that crushes. So it it just resembles me uh, on somebody who has his eyes blindfolded, but is actually uh, sensing when somebody is touching him. That's the state of the art. And as we all have figured out, uh, it takes a lot of knowledge um, to um, build up a model of how this accident has happened just uh, based on this uh, recorded physics data and so uh, the car. So I hold my PhD in physics, so that don't scare me, but how can a victim of an accident um, prove his inox innocent using this sort of car data when the car data are perhaps stored in the opponent's car? Um, luckily, uh, the legal rules are on uh, our side um, 
according to European law. So we have uh, the general data protection regulation um, in Germany, that's the famous uh, Datenschutzgrundverordnung. And um, first of all, um, the Datenschutzgrundverordnung or the GDPR rules um, that every data is owned by who creates the data. And there is no difference if you are creating data by typing it on your keyboard or if you create data by driving in your car. You are the creator of the data, so you are owning this very data. And this could lead to the cause that if I have um, caused a crash, um, I just um, go to this um, GDPR and say nobody can access these data and car companies are on the side of the car owners. But uh, lucky again, there's an important uh, extension uh, um, in the GDPR um, by competent authorities, by police, uh, for prevention or investigation, there has to be an exemption. They have access to this data. How? This is uh, by, governed by state rules. In Germany, the access is regulated by the Strafprozessordnung. So um, to investigate an accident, um, uh, the police officers can collect the data. There's or even holds if the data are stored on the cloud, not in the car, but a remote. This is uh, an important thing, given the amount of data that a modern car collects. So let's have a look how many data a modern car that tries to navigate its environment by um, autonomous driving already connects. So what has a normal car um, um, to deal with? It's not enough with sensing an impact. The car has to look ahead, not only ahead, even to the side. The car has to detect, for example, cut-ins. If some other car tries to cut in my road, just prior to an accident, the car has to break if he's in an autonomous or assisted driving mode. Uh, furthermore, um, all of these cars are equipped with radar. Now hold this. Um, normally, um, speeding car drivers, uh, car drivers with speed, are scared of the police putting up a radar system at the side of the road. Now, most of the modern cars uh, accessing the road of today have radar built in. And um, there's a sensor fusion taking place. You can see this here. So um, what they're doing today is they try to learn um, how to fuse the radar data to the visual data to give an enormous amount of um, spatial awareness. What happens around my car? With what velocity uh, are other cars approaching my car? And everything is stored in the car. Now is the question, how can we access? It could be rather difficult by most German automakers, for example. They often hold to the um, general water protection rules, um, but as most courts have ruled out, this is wrong. Again, uh, the car drivers own the data, and the police is legged to access this data. Some cars make it pretty easy. Now look at this. Um, this is a modern autonomous car um, with a dash cam mode. And um, you can see in the manual that um, you can access the data of the cameras using just a simple USB. You perhaps know these devices with this sort of connector. With speed drive. So in your dashboard, there's an USB connector. You can hook up a drive there, and the car um, would store the data 10 minutes, not only five seconds, uh, as Michael Byte hoped to acquire. 10 minutes prior, all recorded data are stored on this USB chip, and you can activate it on the dashboard or simply by honking, merp, or Obviously, if the airbag comes out, um, this uh, data gets stored in the vehicle and can be accessed by a simple USB drive. So bad news is if you're on the car and have touched a bicyclist, you can just plug it out and throw it away to make your point safely. So that system is uh, useful if everybody has it, but can have an enormous amount of um, justice in court 
should be easy to provide your own innocence. And now imagine, um, you remember the beautiful uh, presentation of Yolanda, how hard it is for a victim to prove his innocence. He has a lot of problems to deal with his uh, own um, uh, insurance company, uh, his impairments perhaps, and now how can he provide um, his innocence without uh, having a PhD in physics. Um, let me just um, uh, prove to you what um, the dash cam cameras provides and data. Uh, you see this uh, connected um, to the mural presentation. I just press on play and hope that's no commercial starting right now. There you see it. Um, that is just out from the USB stick. Another car has just uh, approached from the back, is cutting in in front of this and um, even later gets stuck in the traffic ahead. So the driver of this Tesla have rec has recorded everything from the starting of the cut in. That is approaching in the back, showing away ac access to the rear camera, to the side camera, to the front camera just by honking uh, on his horn or pushing a button on the dashboard. Uh, and if that would have lead to an accident, it would be have quite easy to uh, get justice in court. I'm quite positive about this. Okay, these are the major things I want to show you. And I see, since that is a thing that is starting right now, that rolls into our cars, uh, we should have a position on this early enough to inform everybody that he has the possibility to prove his innocence and to inform the courts and justice that these amounts of data are stored. Today, they are stored for a good cause to make the um, image vision system better. For example, modern cars have difficulties with this situation. Um, like there's a bicycle and it would be, we cognize this as a bicycle. You see this jello bar but the red bar is an error message. So obviously the car can't handle a bicycle that's driving not to the side, but it's hooked to another car. So I'm drawing in depth. So the um, computer is confused here. That's the right rectangle. And what's happening next is that the cars start to collect data from the fleet. That's called fleet learning. So every like 400,000 cars um, are launching their cameras and trying to collect data from bicycle on cars to make uh, the system better. So the large, uh, that's happening to die on the roads. The large um, companies are collecting an incredible amount of data to make their own systems better. Their goal is to prevent all sort of accidents in advance. So um, like uh, reacting on cars that are crashed on the road, even in this case, uh, reacting on cars that are flying against Europe because of a crash on the opposite side of the road. The goal is um, to prevent such sort of accidents. And that's why huge amounts of data are collected right now. I would say this is a good cause, but I, I would say if these data are collected anyway, they should put to use to prove the innocence of victims and to make our roads safer and may it be just because that everybody who drives a car knows that everybody else has a radar device on its car and is uh, ready to provide guilt and innocence if it comes to a crash. That would be my point of today and I thank you so very much for listening. Thank you, thank you very much.